Let me begin by thanking the board member, friends, and supporters of HRNK who have joined us for this program. Um, Ambassador Robert King, former special envoy for North Korean human rights issues, is uh, with us today. Of course, is also a board member of HRNK. Um, Colonel Ash Orms, uh, great to see you have joined us, sir. Uh, many other great friends of um, HRNK. Um, also, my mother has joined us. Um, this is a very special program, and I'm going to provide a very brief explanation as to why we are addressing this tragic and yet fascinating topic. Robert Collins, who's one of our discussants today, uh, the most prolific HRNK author, is very close to finalizing a report on the role of the RGB, the North Korean Reconnaissance General Bureau, in North Korea's policy of human rights denial. As part of this, both Ambassador Ra and Lieutenant General Chun have spoken with Bob. Uh, they shared their experiences, and Ambassador Ra had this extraordinary idea of publishing the translation of his book, initially published in Korean, a book on Kang Min Tol, one of the 1983 Rangoon Burma terrorists. We have an extraordinary lineup of speakers today. The plan is to turn it over to Ambassador Ra first for about 20 minutes for an overview of the book on Kang Min Tol. Then turn it over to Lieutenant General Chun, who was there. He was truly the the, the hero, uh, I won't say unsung hero, because we all know uh, about the extraordinary role he played on that day in rescuing uh, South Korean officials. Uh, we'll turn it over for about 10 minutes to Lieutenant General Tun for, well, um, an opportunity to share his memories, his thoughts on that day, his thoughts on the implications of that day for the history of the Korean Peninsula. And then finally, we'll turn it over to Robert Collins, for an overview of the history and evolution of um, the predecessors of the RGB and the RGB itself. Uh, let me begin by introducing our keynote speaker today. Um, Ambassador Ra Jong-il is um, an academic thought leader, political leader of South Korea. He um, has been a South Korean ambassador to the United Kingdom from 2001 to 2003, also South Korean ambassador to Japan from 2004 to 2007. Uh, he has also led South Korea's intelligence agency. So he, he truly has very, very vast expertise in a variety of areas. I don't, I don't mean to steal his thunder. I'm not going to say anything about the fascinating story of how he came across this evidence about Kang Min Tol. Ambassador Ra is very late in Korea. For all three of you, thank you so much for joining us today. Ambassador Ra, we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you, sir. Um, first of all, uh, the, uh, I wish to thank you all. Um, particularly, this is very late uh, in the night uh, in Korea. Um, uh, I feel a little, little bit out of sorts. Usually, I do not suffer that much from jet lag, but this time, probably a combination of after effect of my uh, contracting COVID-19, unfortunately, in the United States, uh, combined with the uh, jet lag, I feel a little bit sort of lazy, um, etc. And uh, uh, but, but most of all, this is a uh, the great experiences for me and the great privilege to, to, to be able to speak on my, um, on my um, experiences. Um, the, uh, my encounter with this um, the, uh, hero or anti-hero of, 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 of the incident. Uh, in particular, I wish to thank Mr. Scala for you for um, uh, the, yeah, his great sort of work, um, understanding, I, I think the, uh, uh, it's a great sort of 
tribute to Mr. Scala for you, yeah, for, he, for, for him to be able to understand uh, the, the English version of my book. Um, and, and also, uh, I wish to thank him for, uh, for organizing, for his work in organizing this con conference. This is not just the manner of speech. Uh, I really feel this. I, and for the rest of the uh, rest of the time allowed me, I, I will try to explain why I am extremely thankful to all of you, and in particular to Mr. Scala to you, who have worked so much to organize this meeting. Um, let me briefly um, tell you about um, about history of history of the book. Um, this is the uh, <clears throat> Korean Korean uh, the original publication um, in in Korean, and uh, uh, when this this book was out, I was I, I was surprised that New York Times reported on this book at the front page center center place of the front page and it and and it also carried an interview article with me on on the third page that was quite sort of surprising and that was that was a great sort of uh, impression on me um and also uh, there was a um oh, the, the the article in New, New York Times was read by other the mass media in other countries, including Japan, of course, and the um, uh, Singapore um, news, newspaper, Python uh, Review, or something like that. And, and also, there was an Indian media which reported on this. There was a Dutch, Dutch newspaper, too. So it was widely discovered by. Uh, um, media outside of the Korea. Um, as for the, please stop me, or if I'm carried carried away and you know, overspent the time allowed me. And th there is a translation by a very prestigious uh, publisher, Shu Asia in Japan. And this was a great success, I hear, publication success. And because sometimes it remained in the uh, top sales cities in Japan uh, among the books related to uh, to Korean Peninsula. Um, also, uh, there is a Chinese translation I hear from my Chinese friend, but uh, it was uh, it was limited to only two hundred copies, uh, only for the eyes of people. Um, the uh, they should 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 read this book, the professional professional reasons too. Um, I didn't, of course, just claim my copyright um, in that case. Uh, um, on um, and I I was also um, invited by uh, many Western uh, the me, me, Western uh, institutes. Um, like like uh, Leiden University, which is a very excellent research institute on the uh, on issues related to Paris, uh, on and also on Korea, and also so as the uh, School of uh, the African and Asia, uh, the uh, Oriental and the Asian Studies, and University of London, etc. On each of uh, these occasions, there was a demand or a sort of inquiry about when uh, it would be available in English to the English speaking readers. And I was trying to have this published in, uh, I was trying to meet this request. But unfortunately, I have not been able to find any uh, publisher interested in this. Um, uh, the, the real problem, the real problem, uh, what um, I encountered, uh, well, I half expected this, was that uh, it was not received very well in Korea itself. 
And uh, I do understand the reason why uh, many publishers uh, turned away, I mean, turn, turned away, um, I mean, refused to publish this book. And I finally found a publisher in Korea, but the reception was not very, very friendly. And I can, I can very well understand the reason. I mean, uh, people really do not uh, read the books very carefully. And um, they, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, the first impressions and the, the, uh, what, uh, what they gather from the title of the book is that uh, perhaps a large number of people, Koreans, was thinking that I was offering an apology, an apology for a terrorist, and sympathetic, even sympathetic to the to the terrorist. I mean, that's that's basically a misunderstanding. But I could understand the reason behind uh, uh, the uh, their misunderstanding too. Um, and the publication uh, was not was not that much of a success uh, in Korea. And I was subjected to many sort of criticisms and the sarcastic sort of remarks, et cetera. Um, but, but I do understand uh, the reason behind their sort of negative responses. Um, uh, the thing is that I was not, I was not trying to offer an, um, the uh, apology for the terrorists. I mean, uh, Without doubt, there is no question about uh, the fact that Kang Min Chol, together with, uh, with his other the, uh, teammates, uh, were terrorists. I mean, they uh, wrote havoc, uh, destroyed um, many valuable lives, um, inflicted, inflicted um, sort of lots of damage to believe the families, etc. I think. General Chun will be uh, testify about, about the actual scene later. Um, but but what I was trying to do was putting in context, historical and the political concept, the uh, con context uh, which, which have existed in on Korean Peninsula since the establishment of two separate regime uh, in uh, North and the South respectively. Uh, about uh, since the middle of the last last century, um, the uh, relations, the, the basic nature of relations between the two parts of Korea, I once defined as a dynamics of uh, adversarial door. Um, in another writing, or the one in one of my lectures at Cambridge, England. I defined the basic nature of the relations between, existing between uh, two parts of Korea as as a um, <laughs> I termed it I termed it as uh, dynamics of adversarial duo by which I mean um, what happens in one part of the country one part of the uh, one part of the uh, Korean Peninsula has sort of um, a similar reaction from the other, other side. Uh, and there are new, I cited, I quoted numerous instances in which uh, this, this dynamics applies in the relations between the two countries. One instance, interesting enough, was the, uh, the, the South Korean participation in Vietnamese war. Uh, and that was often uh, by uh, request from uh, the United States, which uh, South Korean government found found very difficult to resist or refuse, uh, because of this the spe special relations between the two countries, and as we owe so much to the uh, security guarantee of the United States too. The same applies uh, in the situation when I was um, in in the Blue House when I was a chief assistant for, for the president uh, in international and security matters, we, uh, the United States, the Washington asked us to send the troops to Iraq, uh, which we really did not like. But, but then we had to, we had to send ultimate troops to the, the uh, 
uh, Iraqi, Iraqi country. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, in addition to uh, the uh, request from the United States, we had reason to be to be sending uh, to send our troops to the to, to Vietnam apart from uh, the uh, apart, apart from uh, the uh, justification that it was the same sort of fight against the communism it was supposed to be. However, there was um, an, the another aspect of our participation in Vietnam, uh, which was our own national interest, the economic as well as security, uh, for instance, modernizing uh, the South Korean uh, the, the, uh, equipment of South Korean troops, et cetera, and also giving some battle experiences to the South Korean troops. There was uh, uh, very strong economic reasons behind the two. And mostly, I mean, apart from uh, moral issues, uh, our participation in Vietnam served our national interest. Uh, and there were, of course, a lot of criticism directed against that in domestic as well as international uh, arena. However, strangely enough, North Korea volunteered to participate in Vietnam, in Vietnamese war, uh, which Vietnamese, the uh, Viet Minh government did not ask. What was the reason behind that? I think. That was one of the instances in which that logic of the dynamics of adversarial or when South Korea, South Korea was doing uh, something in Vietnam, North Korea couldn't just sit back in, in the, sit back in either. And they, 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 uh, they, they asked North, North, the uh, North Vietnam, Viet Minh government, North, North Vietnamese government for their participation in, uh, in the war. Which ultimately they did, Air Force mostly, pilots, and also some psychological experts to uh, to the uh, uh, for the pro propaganda or anti propaganda purposes for directed against us, mainly against the uh, South Korean uh, soldiers serving in in Vietnam, etc. In in any case, um, you see, you cannot. Uh, you cannot um, deal with any important event either in North Korea or in South Korea without corresponding responses from the other side. I think at present the COVID-19 crisis applies, that applies in the same way uh, the, uh, in, in, in explaining uh, reactions from the um, both parts of the parts of Korea. In any case, um, the um, um, Aung San attack uh, was not just the one sided North Korean uh, act of terrorism. It was a response to what happened three years before in Gwangju, South Korea. Uh, the, uh, I, do not, I, I think I do not have to explain what happened in Gwangju 1980. Um, after the assassination of Park Chung hee. 19, at the end of the 1979, uh, there was a great hope for ultimate the uh, democratization of Korea, uh, which was sort of shattered by uh, what they call uh, military coup d'etat of Chen Duhan, General Chen Duhan. And when there was a the civil unrest, demonstrations and the protest, etc., in Gwangju in the spring of 1980. Uh, the military suppressed it, uh, relying on uh, violence, uh, killing uh, quite a few hundred, few hundred people, even people. Um, and North Korea couldn't just sit back and watch this. And I think they uh, they felt like intervening in military through military means too. How, however, their choice was very limited because. Uh, unlike what happened in the 1950, half, uh, the, uh, half a century ago, uh, no, half the, a generation's time ago, America made this intention very clear that they would not sort of tolerate North Korean military sort of intervention in, uh, in South, South Korea by sending, you see, that uh, mobile uh, the, uh, naval uh, air force uh, 
flee to South Korean to South Korean port, Busan. What their choice was um, assassination, the act of terrorism. I think that was the only sort of choice they uh, they, they could the uh, remained for them. Uh, the consequence was Aung San. But even before then, North Korea tried to assassinate um, South Korean president, General Chan Doo Han, and any, uh, in, at first in Canada, and then in the Philippines, both failed. In that case, it was not uh, North Korean military which uh, tried to uh, do the war. Uh, instead, they tried to, to recruit local violence group, mostly sort of illegal uh, terrorist group, like mafia, the local sort of, uh, people. And they lost lots of money without gaining any. Some in, in case of Canada, the, the, uh, the criminal group just took the money, a lot of money, several a couple of million dollars, and then reported to the police what the North Koreans were trying. So, the complete failure. And also in the Philippines, they tried to employ a uh, local um, criminal group to kill uh, John Dohan while John Dohan was on, on the golf field. Also failed, I mean, completely failed. After that, uh, they employed uh, military, the mainly the, uh, the general, general Reconnaissance Bureau. Uh, people actually highly trained, very yeah, very capable and competent uh, trained people. Uh, they tried to assassinate um, third attempt was at in Cabo, Africa. Um, that was also a failure. Uh, it was a near success, but at the highest level, very very top level, Kim Il Sung uh, rejected. Uh, rejected that idea. The reason was political because please stop me if I'm carried away. To, uh, the, uh, what happened was that Kim Il Sung sort of uh, rejected that, um, rejected to endorse the project because he uh, he's, he, uh, he tried very hard to um, uh, to um, to plant his political influences in African countries somehow. It's quite sort of, uh, this is not very, 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 very promising project, but he spent a lot of political money, finance, financial help, help diplomatic, um, the, um, di diplomatic efforts, etc. And Kim Il-sung uh, refused to, in those Kim Jong Il's project of assassinating Chen Duan in Kabul, because because that will alienate and that will negate all their diplomatic and economic sort of efforts to uh, to plant their political political influences in African countries. Uh, this is extraordinarily extraordinarily helpful context leading up to the the. A key incident that you and terrorist attack that you address in the book, basically on the, the 9th of October 1983, um, North Korean agents uh, planted a bomb at the yeah. Martyrs Mausoleum in Rangoon, Burma. Uh, 14 top representatives of an extraordinary South Korean generation of technocrats and patriots were killed. Presidential yeah. advisors, journalists, security officials, and your book focuses on one of the three terrorists, the lone survivor, who was yeah. abandoned by his regime. Nobody would take him in. He languished in prison for a couple of decades before dying. Yeah. I hope you bear with me since we have reached that day. I hope you don't mind terribly if I turn it over to Lieutenant General Tony Mbom. Sure, sure. Who was, yeah. there, who was there on that day? And uh, we are, of course, all aware uh, of his role, but uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll leave it up to him 
to, to wow. speak about that. They, of course, we all know that General Tan Yim Bum is uh, also a great scholar, soldier, Korean patriot, um, Lieutenant General in the Republic of Korea Army Special Warfare Command. Of course, currently retired um, Lieutenant General, a constant presence um, in the media, um, a constant thought leader, uh, highly respected, again, as uh, a great Korean patriot and friend of the United States, highly respected on uh, both sides of the Pacific. So Ambassador Ra will come back to you. We'll sure. first go to, we'll next go to General Tun for his reflections on that, on that tragic day. Thank you, Greg. Uh, thank you, Professor Ra, for uh, being the uh, catalyst for today's uh, event. So in 1983, I was 25 years old and I was the aide to the chairman of the Korea Joint Chiefs of Staff. And at that time, the chairman of the Korean Joint Chiefs also uh, had the duties of being the head of the anti-espionage armed infiltrations measures department. In Korean, it's called uh, what this is, is in cases of armed infiltration by North Korean agents or uh, commandos, he had the authority to integrate Korean military, police, paramilitary, civil military to make sure that uh, they were countered. So during the early 80s, it was a quite busy period for this organization because the North Koreans attempted to infiltrate, to conduct missions to embarrass the South Korean government, to kidnap South Korean people, and also to uh, take uh, North Korean sympathizers from South Korea to North Korea uh, to be trained and then sent back to South Korea. So it was a very, uh, very complex and very uh, active, uh, not in a good way, on the Korean Peninsula. Going to the 9th of October of 1983, um, I must say that a catastrophic day is no different from any morning or any day. That's the real frightening thing. And so that day started like any other day. It was normal. Uh, we had a very uh, short uh, event, which was to pay our uh, respects to the Burmese national hero, General Aung San. And it was going to be a very short uh, ceremony, maybe 15 minutes. I wasn't even supposed to go along. I just volunteered to do so. And my chairman, he said, yeah, you know, go, go and see, uh, see the sights. So we arrived a little bit early. I had problems with my camera. Uh, I wanted to take some good photos of my chairman with the president. Uh, and because I had problems with my camera, I had uh, went to the parking area just before the explosion. And just before the explosion, I saw two white uh, BMW vehicles with uh, the Korean flag, as well as the Burmese flag, escorted by motorcycle policemen. And I, I thought it was the uh, Korean president. Apparently, the North Korean agents also thought that it was the North Korean, pre uh, it was our, the South Korean president. So I was about 300 meters away, and I heard this sound, and it, in recollection, it was the uh, band leader, the bugler, and testimony says that one of the security people wanted to check all the you know, people there, and he directed the bugler to uh, practice uh, and make a note. And so he did, and apparently the agents took that as a, another signal that President Chun was uh, had arrived, and so that's when they detonated a remote-controlled device uh, with many uh, fragments, uh, type like a Claymore mine. And with my own eyes, I saw the roof of the uh, mausoleum explode. Uh, it was a there was no fireball, but 
ladies and gentlemen, I can attest to you that it was a big bang. So I was uh, very scared to the degree that I did not even know I was scared. And because of the military instincts that were taught to me, uh, I ran. I ran to the to the to the um, to the explosion site and to my boss. Uh, halfway down, I realized that everybody else was running the other way, and then the smell of the explosion uh, hit me. Uh, then I got really scared. Uh, people, I think, become immobilized, but. In this case, uh, I thought, you know, there's no choice. Uh, I did not hold any chance that my uh, chairman was alive, but approaching the uh, explosion site, I noticed that he was there and he was still alive. So uh, I pulled him out, uh, tried to take him to the hospital. There was a lot of confusion. And I can only say that God uh, chose that it was not going to be his day to be uh, dead because of all of the 18 senior Korean officials that were at that site, 16 died immediately and one other person died the next day. So the Korean chairman was the only person that survived. My infamy, Uh, was gained because the NBC TV cameraman uh, was filming the whole uh, event. And when the explosion occurred, he forgot to turn off his camera. So everything was caught on tape. And I got a lot of credit that, you know, I did, I don't think I really deserve. But anyway, um, it, it, it opened me to many things. Number one is, you know, this, Despite my job, and as I told you in the beginning, there were many incidents where the North Koreans had infiltrated and failed. So we had, uh, we had, we had killed them. And their bodies were, I won't say displayed, but when, when my chairman and I arrived on the scene, bodies were there. And I was only 24 years old, so I had not seen that many dead bodies. So I was very curious. But I was not you know, new to death. But on that day, seeing that many people killed, uh, the smells and all that, even at that moment, I did not believe it was North Korea. Even I, as a, as a Korean officer, having seen and had that limited experience, I did not believe it was North Korea until the next day, the very people that Professor Ra mentioned, one of them was killed and two were captured and they turned out to be North Koreans. So that was the moment that I realized, holy Christ, these North Koreans, they're not rational. So it seems the North Koreans thought that by killing Chun Doo-hwan, they would actually be welcomed by the South Korean public. Now, after the incident, uh, my chairman and I were uh, evacuated to uh, the Philippines, to Clark Air Base, where the Americans had a huge air base at that time and a very uh, sophisticated hospital facility. And he stayed there for a month to uh, be healthy enough to travel. During this time, uh, the South Korean military was very, very uh, mad at the situation. And my friends who were on, on the front lines had their ammunition ready and they were going to, you know, retaliate. To the credit of Chun Doo Han, he, uh, he ordered restraint. In fact, he ordered every frontline corps and division commander that they will not unilaterally conduct any kind of operation against the North Koreans. This probably saved another Korean war on the Korean Peninsula. To the decrement of the North Koreans, during those early 80s, the nine aligned nations of the world uh, thought that you know Korea and North Korea were pretty much the same. Both were dictatorships. You know, uh, South Korea was getting a little bit better, but not that great than uh, North Korea. But with this incident, the North Koreans lost all credibility amongst the nine ally- aligned nations of the world. And so it really became a, a diplomatic victory for the South Koreans. 
and uh, ironically uh, for ch the Chenduan government. And I believe that these kind of, uh, this incident actually contributed to Korea winning the uh, nomination for the 88 Olympics as well. And so I think from this uh, point on, uh, North Korea lost its credibility as a nation, uh, as a responsible nation, and where South Korea, despite its great loss and sacrifice, uh, we were able to gain that kind of uh, moral superiority against the North Koreans. Finally, I just want to say that I, 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 I hope for peace on the Korean Peninsula, but I have I just want to. I, I just want to stress that peace with North Korea will only come if we are strong enough that they will, they will not uh, conduct these kind of acts. And I, I feel, I know, and I believe that the fundamentals of North Korean society, especially their regime have not changed. So we must be ready, we must be vigilant and we must thank ourselves that every day that, that there is no incident on the Korean Peninsula. But again, nothing can be taken for granted. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant General Chun. Uh, a, an absolutely fascinating account of a, a truly tragic day in the history of the Republic of Korea and great words of advice in addition to the wisdom shared by Ambassador Ra with us, peace through strength through a strong US-South Korea alliance, through a strong uh, South Korea military, through strong commitment to the peace, security, and prosperity of our allies, especially South Korea. Um, I'm going to go next to Bob Collins, whom you all know. He's a, a scholar, former chief of strategy for US Forces Korea, the most prolific HRNK author, author of Song Boon Pyongyang Republic, From Cradle to Grave, uh, Human Rights Denial at the Local Level in uh, North Korea, many other studies and reports. Uh, Bob, both Ambassador Ra and uh, Lieutenant General Chun have mentioned that there had been other attempts on the life of the South Korean president before they failed. But once military intelligence took charge, uh, it became an entirely different story. Um, I was hoping you could share your thoughts and expertise on the RGB, in particular, the predecessors of the RGB, uh, a, a brief history and evolution, um, um, and your thoughts on the role of RGB, basically the main arm of, uh, of North Korean military intelligence. On to you, sir. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, august body. Um, it's an honor to be in the same uh, presentation as, uh, as uh, Professor Ra and General Chun. Um, I know that uh, I'll need to shorten this up a bit. Um, my greetings to several of the audience who I know, and, um, but if I go, if we go back to the beginning of North Korean capability in terms of intelligence, um, it was a very basic. Um, uh, in the Korean War, there were two divisions of uh, of the Korean troops that were under uh, Chinese uh, People's Army control, and those were repatriated back to um, North Korea in 1949, and they became the experience at uh, uh, fighting the war uh, from 50 to 53. And the, the ability to infiltrate um, was the more outstanding capability during that time. What I, and, and there were later on consequences and infected the uh, uh, Korean People's Army training um, using basic Morse code, which was uh, a standard uh, communication practice during the Korean War on both sides, um, they could determine the, the, uh, where the, the lines of, uh, of authority between frontline divisions and regiments uh, came. And that is the weakest point for commanders to be able to judge as to what do they control and what do they not. So the North Koreans learned how to penetrate um, these lines and it was very successful for them uh, and provided a great expertise later down the road. Um, so in the, later in the 1950s, 
um, uh, uh, there was a number of, uh, as, a, as there was some development of North Korean intelligence agencies, which at the time were mostly party and some in the military, they, uh, they began their operations to target um, South Korea and it either incorporated under the Kim regime um, or to destroy uh, any rock public uh, confidence in their own government. They started uh, uh, hijacking planes and ships and, um, and taking uh, several uh, fishermen back to uh, North Korea and trying to train them to be uh, uh, agents, uh, sleeping agents, um, back uh, after, you know, a year or two after they returned to South Korea. You get into the 1960s and there was a great expansion of, uh, of DMZ activity and infiltration, coastline DM, uh, infiltration activity. Um, and this coastline infiltration activity was the forerunner to the operations department of the Korean Workers' Party. Um, the frontline uh, infiltrations um, led to over a thousand incidents in the 1960s and indeed, 1966 to 1969 is sometimes referred to as the Second Korean War um, because there were so many deaths on all sides to include over 100 Americans. Um, and uh, um, but in the hundreds on each side, as uh, um, General Chun was referring to, the very dramatic time in terms of, uh, of that kind of operation. Um, but that was the that's where their capabilities, North Korean capabilities lied um, and led to the first, uh, uh, one of the incidents was the, the 124th unit of the Reconnaissance Bureau, um, the forerunner to the Reconnaissance General Bureau, um, where uh, a, a number of uh, agents infiltrated um, through the DMZ over ridge lines, again, between unit uh, lines of uh, communication uh, and got very close to what is called, you know, uh, to the Blue House. The whole thing is called the Blue House Raid. Um, of course, they were not successful, but uh, this was a very uh, well-planned and well-executed uh, operation. Um, and there were several other attempts, as we just uh, talked about one of them, uh, that uh, targeted uh, the, the the uh, president of the Republic of Korea. Um, as we get past the 60s and into the 70s, there began to be some more um, uh, sophistication in, in North Korean abilities. Um, one of those was high, just uh, kidnapping uh, South Koreans um, off the coastline, just as they were kidnapping uh, Japanese off their coastline, and even kid, as you well know, Greg, kidnapped uh, one Romanian woman. At any rate, these uh, uh, Koreans were taken back and they, you know, they became sources for understanding South Korean societal culture, which was developing far differently than that that was in the North. Um, and uh, um, this was an expansion in the 70s uh, of that capability. Uh, we get in the 80s as the technical capabilities of, of North Korea began to expand. Um, uh, uh, they used some, you know, some infiltrations into South Korea via third countries, particularly Japan, one of the uh, <clears throat> assassinations attempts against uh, President Park was from that. Um, and uh, that was the external affairs department of the party. Um, as we get into the 90s, now technology seems to have uh, become more important in terms of their operations against um, South Korea, um, and uh, particularly in terms of communication up until the late 90s, the, uh, um, the, the uh, North Koreans would uh, use a very specific code based on, uh, on books and other instruments to, to send uh, signals to their agents. But as the internet developed, uh, particularly moving into the first decade of this century, the, they changed from that style to using the internet to communicate um, 
their uh, orders and signals to uh, sleeper agents that were in uh, the Republic of Korea. As uh, the, uh, this developed, um, the Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un's father, uh, decided to consolidate um, as much of the uh, in intelligence community under one flag and one head as possible uh, and created the Reconnaissance General Bureau in 2009. And its main components were one, the Reconnaissance Bureau uh, within the military uh, that has uh, several battalions that have the capability to infiltrate over the land and, and, and see. Also, the operations department of the party, which was the, which is kind of like trained for infiltrating the coastline. They're like Navy SEALs. They have that kind of capability, and they would infiltrate to carry subterfuge or even escort uh sleepier agents into, uh, into the South. And then the third primary uh, organization that was brought under the Reconnaissance General Bureau was uh, Office 35, which is responsible for um, targeting South Korea through third countries and establishing uh, information systems overseas that would um, uh, aid the uh, Kim regime's intent. Um, and so bringing all these together Eventually, Kim Jong-un became the head of this and essentially is the primary leader of that, although Kim Jong-il is the three-star that heads the organization. Um, and you know, nominally, the RGB is part of the Korean People's Army, but it takes its orders directly from uh, Kim Jong-un and the Central Military Committee of the Korean Workers' Party. Now, as we moved into the, the last uh, 12 years, the expansion within the RGB of capability has primarily been cyber. And those capabilities have been uh, very, very uh, productive for uh, the North Koreans. They, they, uh, they select these cyber operators from, uh, from a middle school, just like they do for nuclear scientists and rocket scientists, and early on begin their training and education at selected universities in Pyongyang, and then they deploy them overseas where they can operate off the internet, which they can't do in North Korea, um, and, you know, Manchuria, Shanghai, uh, and some other locations within China or um, uh, East Asia. Um, and uh, basically the cyber uh, element, which is a, a technical aspect of RGB, is uh, very successful at not only uh, uh, cyber operations against the rock public, but also cyber crime, where they steal uh, monies from banks or, uh, or cryptocurrency um, and have used this capability to uh, augment and finance North Korea's nuclear and missile programs. Um, and so that's come, become somewhat of a dominant capability within the RGB. Um, they certainly haven't uh, stopped in terms of uh, their ability to, to develop infiltration capabilities or any of those other like, substitutes, assassinations and, uh, and whatnot. The, uh, so that's, that's still a good training, but it, it, the cyber operations now within the RGB have become a dominant force. And uh, I think uh, time considering, I think I'll uh, cut it short right there. Thank you, Greg. Bob, thank you very much. We have a little bit of time left. We'll take uh, one or two questions. To ask a question, please use the chat icon or the Q&A icon available on the bottom bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Of course, if you have additional questions, I'm going to type in my uh, email address in the chat. Uh, feel free to direct them to me. I will uh, in turn send them to our distinguished speakers. We have also posted the English translation of Ambassador Ra's book on our website, hrnk.org. Um, my colleague Raymond Ha, whom I thank very much for his good and hard work organizing this program, Raymond has um, posted the link um, in the chat. Of course, you may ask questions also by raising your hand in Zoom. And if you want to do that by unmuting your camera and uh, mic 
and uh, joining us on the screen. Now, I, I don't mean to get into trouble, Ambassador Rob, but let me just ask you one question. So you, you presented extraordinarily helpful context and explained how in the mind of the North Korean leadership, they were responded, uh, they were responding to the Kwangju uprising somehow uh, believing that they were liberating the people of South Korea by doing this. So could this be interpreted as the following? The North Korean regime actually did intervene and did interfere with the events surrounding the Kwangju uprising by attempting to conduct a terrorist attack against the South Korean president. So would this completely eliminate the argument that the North Koreans had absolutely nothing to do with the events of that day? I, I know this is a delicate question and I hope I, um, I formulated it uh, in, in a way that, that's neutral, but uh, I'm just very curious to hear your views. Ambassador, please uh, unmute your mic, sir. Okay, yeah. Um, I must remind you uh, of the fact that there is a legislation uh, introduced, uh, legalized by um, the previous regime, um, the National Assembly, the, uh, they legislated that any sort of uh, idea, any sort of um, the uh, remark on the um, uh, other than sort of official uh, interpretation of the Kwangju incident. I mean, for instance, uh, there was a substantial North Korean intervention in the uh, incident, etc., are uh, punishable by, by law. So we are not free to uh, say that. I mean, uh, but there is no evidence that North Korea intervened or even organized that uprising. Um, uh, 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 however, um, uh, it is difficult to think. I mean, um, to think that North Korea completely set back and just watched it because North Korea has a large number of their own agents in South Korea. I mean, their identity were hidden and uh, some of uh, the uh, intelligence people testify that uh, North Korea did not really intervene in any massive scale through the uh, the RGB, etc. But uh, their uh, number of their agents uh, the, the, uh, sleeping um, for a long time, etc. Couldn't couldn't just sit just sit back and watch what was happening in in Gwangju, Gwangju area. I have lots of testimony from my uh, my people, but but we cannot openly sort of the uh, uh, just legally sort of. We will be making uh, amenable to criminal punishment by, by, by law. I think that the law has changed, should be changed now, because the, um, uh, if, if the circumstances uh, allow, allow that, whatever the next National Assembly or things like that. Right. One thing uh, I, I'd like to add to what um, uh, the uh, the, the General Chan and also the uh, General Collins uh, said that. Also, uh, Mr. Scandal, for you, um, he, he, uh, agreed to that. Uh, first of all, it is essential that we should be able to, through strengths, to be able to the, uh, prevent any other sort of military provocations from uh, North Korea, be it terrorist attack or the uh, military intervention, military attack uh, against the South Korea. That is given. I mean, this is the basic uh, condition of our security, maintaining our security. On the other hand, we should be able to differentiate. We should be able to tell North Korean regime from North Korean people. That's a different, different thing. And we should be able to maintain contact and the exchanges with the people as much as possible. Uh, that um, that I, I'd like to add. And all the, also, uh, the, uh, that's what I, the, in part, that's what, what I was trying to, uh, trying to say in my book. That Kang Min-chan, of course, he, the, he is a criminal terrorist, 
responsible. But in a way, um, he was caught in that inexorable law of the, um, um, what I call dynamics of the uh, uh, adversarial law. Uh, he was caught in that, uh, that basic sort of logic of hostility between the two, two parts of Korea. And individual, fate of individual should be, should be given proper considerations uh, in this case. I mean, he, when uh, he was shown what was happening in Gwangju area, South Korean troops killing and shooting uh, civilians, he was persuaded that uh, what he had learned through uh, political indoctrination, political propaganda was really true. The South Korean soldiers are sort, sort of running the dog of American imperialism. They are against uh, South Korean people, etc. Later, he realized that was not the case, but that was, of course, too late. I mean, that was um, uh, he himself was a victim uh, of that um, the hostility between the two two parts of Korea. But also, the motivation behind the Chandran's visit to Burma was not quite right. It was had nothing to do with diplomacy, uh, with with any. Uh, it was just for his political gains. I mean, uh, he went to Burma. Uh, foreign office was completely against that, but they didn't uh, didn't dare to enter their sort of uh, objections to the, what John Duhan was uh, was telling them, instructing them to do. Burma was completely irrelevant to the diplomatic missions, the presidential, the part, presidential parties' diplomatic missions. Chen Duan went to there, as I wrote in my book, just how to prolong uh, his sort of uh, influences even after the expiry of his the uh, his, his office, as uh, the Burmese government was doing. General Levin was sitting back. I mean, retired from uh, the top position of the country, but still he was behind the behind the scene, pulling all the all the strings behind the nominal government. And the Chandran tried to learn a page from that experience. And uh, um, uh, there is reason to take a special consideration to uh, an individual like Kang min -chan. He was 25 years of age, and he served in the prison, all crippled, uh, lost his arms. And he was, he was um, crippled, not through the uh, Burmese people, Burmese soldiers or Burmese uh, police, he was injured. He was he was uh, injured by the booby trap set by North Korean raiding. His the, uh, hand, grenade, hand grenade given to the, the terrorists was a booby trap. It exploded, exploded in their own hand. So all of them, two of them lost their sort of left, left arms. Some people, say that they wanted to uh, commit suicide, but that's not true. I know all the manual of North Korean, the uh, RGB, how to commit suicide. When they have a grenade, they should explode, explode it under their chin like that. That ensures complete sort of success of a suicide. If do not have their, do not have any weapon to kill their sin, they are instructed to uh, a stone or with a fist hit their chin like this with their tongue stuck out. And then that, that if their tongue is cut, they would, they, they, they would kill themselves by bleeding. And that sort of things. But North Korean agent, both the, the major Kim, Kim Jin Su and the, the Kang Min Chol didn't do that. They just wanted to survive. And also, we should be aware of the enormous ability of North Korean RGB people, the special forces. I mean, they infiltrated in 1968, at, even at the gate of a Blue House, the president's residence and the office. I mean, even so, we set up all sorts of barricades and took, we tried to intercede them, but they outran uh, in, the, in the, uh, the depths of the winter. They, the yeah, yeah. outmaneuvered all those sort of barricades and blockades we set up and made their way to the to the gate of the blue house. 
they could have really succeeded. Well, thank you, sir. We are already um, in overtime. We've had a lot of really sure. good questions. I'm going to, no, 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 it, it, this is not about you, Ambassador. It's about the questions. Thank you, sorry. Greatly appreciate it. This is a fantastic experience, really. I am going to pick two questions. I apologize. I know in overtime, General Chun and Bob, let's go for truly a lightning round. Some very quick answers. General Chun, we have one question uh, about the RGB. What is the future of RGB operations? Um, can we expect the RGB could become more active in the future in conducting kinetic operations? And Bob, how did the terrorist attack in Burma affect office 35 operations moving forward from then on, from 19, 1983 on. Thank you, gentlemen. General Chun will go to you first. So I'm really concerned because an organization like the North Korean RGB, the Reconnaissance uh, General Bureau, uh, they have the ability to conduct and execute one-way missions. And right now, a political goal would be to embarrass the new Yoon government that has, in the words of the North Koreans, been antagonizing them, and they need to be taught a lesson. And when you have a determined organization like the RGB with the past history and their capabilities with cyber and all of this, it's a very dangerous situation that I see. And so not a day goes by that I am worried that the RGB and their uh, subjects might try to, to uh, scare the South Koreans to split the alliance and all these activities. So I, I find it very grave indeed. Thank you, sir. Bob, effects on Bureau 35? Um, certainly from a North Korean or a Kim regime perspective, it was a, it, the Burma operation was a near success. Um, and so the techniques that were used in terms of infiltrating uh, people into the coastline of Burma uh, and uh, uh, operating in a foreign involvement and doing it so precisely that they almost got it right uh, certainly was an encouraging sign for the uh, Kim regime leadership. And <clears throat> so, as I was mentioning earlier, by the time the 1990s rolled around, the 80s and 90s, I should say, there was some significant up, uh, uh, upscale of 35 uh, operations that would infiltrate um, North Koreans or North Korean sympathizers into South Korean society um, and for the purpose of developing uh, pro-North Korean attitudes um, or even or even leading to the, the establishment of uh, underground groups and whatnot. So 35 really had uh, somewhat of a heyday in the 80s and 90s. Um, uh, today, the, I mean, over the last couple of decades, and, and Professor Ra would know this information far better than I do, the number of North Korean agents that have been uh, arrested are quite numerous. Um, as the uh, South Korean intelligence gets better um, at uh, uh, finding these individuals. Um, and uh, hopefully some recent decisions um, prior to President Yoon administration um, don't uh, lead to uh, other sorts of uh, setbacks in terms of uh, finding these agents and uh, and eliminating them from South Korean society. Well, thank you very much. I know we had more questions. We are out of time. This was an absolutely exquisite program. Again, it was a program about tragedy. Um, again, as Ambassador Ross said, his book is not about um, uh, saying positive things about a terrorist. It's, it's a truly tragic story, though, that followed that, that catastrophic day. Um, one can think of Song Boon and what Bob has written about Song Boon. The system uh, classifies the entire population based on its loyalty to the regime, but this is a one-way road. It is not a two-way road. The regime is not loyal to its most loyal soldiers. It booby traps their grenades. Wow. It sends them on, on suicide missions, and then it abandons them in jails, in foreign jails, where they languish and suffer and die wow. decades later. Gentlemen, this has been an extraordinary program. Ambassador Ra, thank you very much. Uh, Lieutenant General Chun, thank you very much. 
Bob, thank you very much. Um, I look forward to staying in touch. And Bob, we all look forward to your upcoming reports coming to a theater near you soon. Enjoy the rest of the summer. And thank you for joining us so late. Uh, Get some good rest, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.